Hey folks, all right, we're just about ready to get started with this episode of This Week in Photo. Waiting in the wings, can't see him, I can see him, is uh, Mr. Julio Shorio. We're going to be talking about some very interesting stuff. We're going to start the show in just about 15 seconds, so please stand by. All right, folks, welcome to This Week in Photo. This is another one of our hybrid live shows where I get to put a good friend of mine or and another photographer on the hot seat, and we'll be talking about the topic du jour for this episode. This week, it is all about why, or maybe why, you shouldn't be considering starting a photography business. Uh, when we get started, you'll see my good friend right here, Mr. Julio Shorio, is on the hot seat again, going to be talking about this stuff. And uh, yeah, we're going to dive in. And then for the featured interview, it will be um, my friend Jeff Cable, who's an Olympic photographer, as well as a just sort of day-to-day -day photographer where he shoots weddings and bar mitzvahs and all that kind of stuff. And he's going to... he's he came on, this is a pre-recorded interview, he came on to talk about his experiences and some of the, some of the lessons he learned while trying to manage a, a full household here in Silicon Valley, you know, wife, kids, etc., um, while also traveling the world and being a professional photographer and living that life. So the spoiler, not to bury the lead, is it ain't easy, folks. <laughs> so we're gonna find out. We're gonna find out why. So if you've watched this show before, or these episodes before, you know that these. Uh, basically, what I'm doing here is you're you you get to see a a behind the scenes version of the recording of the Twip podcast. So um, you'll see how the sausage is made, basically. <laughs> so I'm gonna record the intro do a little pause, and then introduce Julio Shorio, then we'll off, we're off into the races. Um, we'll do a little sponsor, welcome, and then uh, towards the end of the show, once Julio, Julio and I finish getting to the bottom of what it takes to run a successful photography business, then I'll run the interview with Jeff Cable, and you get to enjoy that as well. Uh, lastly, housekeeping-wise, the Jeff Cable interview is also going to be published to the TWIP YouTube channel and into our podcast feed standalone. So if you don't want to see Julio and I, and you just want to you know, be able to access that interview by itself, it'll be there for you. Okay. All right. Julio, are you ready to go, man? I am. All right. Stand by. Here we go. We're starting episode 571 of This Week in Photo. Here's the intro. <clears throat> in this episode of TWIP, it's all about why you shouldn't be starting a photography business. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Tonight on the show, we are live streaming. I'm sitting here with my good friend, Mr. Julio Shorio. Julio and I are going to dive into some of the ins and outs behind running your own business, your own photography business, and why that may not be a good idea for some people. It might be a good idea for other people, but we're going to get to the bottom of that. Um, before we dive into that, I want to thank our sponsor for this episode of This Week in Photo, and that's our good friends over at Creative Live. You can find them at Creative Live live.com tons and tons of courses that they have over there for you to, to download they I believe creative life started with photography as sort of their the main thrust of what the business is about um, with with a friend of the show Chase Jarvis and then they went on to add other verticals and different types of photography or I'm sorry different types of of businesses and content that you can consume over there but creativelive.com you know their model if you don't if you, you're not familiar with creative live the model is they broadcast their shows live and you can watch the live broadcast for free so if you have the time you can sit down and consume what they have to offer for nothing but then uh, if you'd like to watch it on demand and have access to it in your creative live account then you pay for the course and uh, and you can have it so you get basically it's the best the best of both worlds we love those guys they're doing some fantastic work uh, they're juggernauts in the industry now I remember when the, when creative live first got started it was tiny 
uh, as many just getting started businesses are. But then they went on and now they are they're absolutely crushing it over at Creative Live. Content is way beyond most things that you see on on some other competing online services, education services. But, um, you know, it's, it's just a different way of learning, and they, they do a really good job at that. So check them out at creativelive.com, friends of this week in photo. All right, let's start the show. Julio Shorio, like I mentioned, is here to talk to us about some of the uh, the ins and outs and his learnings, good and bad, when it comes to running your own photography business. Julio, how you doing, man? I haven't, I haven't talked to you in two weeks. What's going on? Dude, I just went out and bought my first Ferrari. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you just went and bought a Ferrari? <laughs> and I'm going to show you how to do it. You just got to buy my five-step program. There you Links go. Below. Exactly. What's up? Oh, no, wait, no, wait. No, wait. I, I'm going to show you how to be a millionaire. Just send me a dollar. A million people, send me a dollar, then I'm going to tell you how I made a million dollars. Right, just buy my book, and at the end it says... Make a book and sell it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because it's that easy. Yeah. yeah. Go boosh. Yeah. It's, it's the art of the steel. Money. Yeah. The art of the steel. Let's do it. So, man, let, so let's get a little background on you before you, you know, like I said, you were on the show uh, a couple weeks ago and you and I were chatting. Sue Bryce was the special insert guest back then. People love Sue Bryce. So it's, it's a phenomenon. Um, uh, but, you know, for the folks that may not be familiar who Julio G. Shorio is. Give us your quick elevator pitch before we dive into the content. Sure. I've been a photographer since 93, um, full time since 2005. The only photographer ever to have been sponsored by Olympus and Panasonic, to my knowledge. Um, shot the biggest issues for Village Voice Media. Uh, left kind of all of that uh, behind to put my focus on. Um, I'm all about I'm all about where the future of photography is going, and put my focus on on uh, the future of photography, which is uh, which is vision and creativity. Oh, I I, <laughs> I created a lot of techniques and technologies for um, uh, creating cinemagraphs some time ago. Yeah, you but, did. That's where yeah. you and I, you and I met. I don't know. I think we knew each other before then, but you and I were having conversations about you know, cinemagraphs and motion type stuff being sort of the next big thing. Mm -hmm. Where is that gone? Is that, is that, you, you still feel that way? Or was that, you know, a lot of people back then were saying that it's a fad and it, is that bearing itself out or is it just another way for people to, you know, share their vision? It's a fad like HDR is a fad. So if that is what inspires you to create, then, you know, just by all means still do it. Um, it's it's something that at the time was fresh and new and, and and so everybody was wanting to figure out how to do it and uh, they were very effective Be, in in a sea of still images having something to move a little bit was very effective I think people are desensitized to it now but it's like anything else it's like um, every so often people are really into skateboarding or you know and then it kind of dies down and it comes back it'll be you know it'll come back again at some point. Um, well, Eddie, Eddie Lagos, uh, what's up, Eddie in the chat is asking, what's a cinemagraph? <laughs> so so a cinemagraph is a photograph that's based from video and, uh, and the video is just 30 frames a second or 24 frame, whatever. It's just a series of frames. Part of that image that you see is a static image. So the photograph, that's the master frame. If you were to imagine layers and below that master frame is the video that loops Okay, and so then imagine that photo has a piece that's punched out, and then it just kind of looks like the photo has parts of it that's a living, yeah. like a living photo, and part of it that's not. Uh, but there's tons of ways that that those types of photos have not been exploited yet. Stuff that I've techniques I developed and I show it to people, and they're just like, we don't know how to use this yet. So, but you know, I was doing cinema graphs in 2009, and people were like, what are we gonna do with this? I'm like, do you see that thing in your hand? Like, yeah, that's okay. That that iPhone that's in version two or three or whatever is going to be super huge and everyone will have one one day. And if that's what they have in their hand and they can display a still image, but also a moving image, you may have an advantage with the moving image. I mean, call me crazy. And it, yeah. and it took forever for that to catch on. So yeah, I mean, it's the a screen, right? Of it, 
it's, it's the well, idea I, it's the idea that that there are screens everywhere even when we first started talking the the idea was okay there you you're the the sort of soapbox that you were standing on was there there's screens everywhere they're in your pocket they're in your living room they're in the airport they're in times square why not create content that is more visual than just a static image right exactly so that's, that's that was where the they thing. came from that was the thing so after the economy kind of came back a little bit um and people were starting to realize hey what i have on my phone is more than than a print not that prints are i love prints but you know, it was more than a print. And then screens started popping up everywhere. Screens over urinals and, and, and hotels and stuff. I'm like, so if that's a screen and it can do a static image, cool. But what if it moved? Then it's video. But what if it moved just a little bit? One of that kind of, since we're so used to seeing a static image and then we're so used to seeing a video image if something was a little bit in between. And people are like, wow, that's really creepy. And they just didn't know how to react. But eventually it caught on because it sold goods and services. Because that's mm-hmm. what commercial photography is, is to sell goods and services and it worked. Yeah. And, um, for a while there I was making a lot of money over, um, from those images. And, yeah. uh, then one day it just went it just literally shut off, which is often the case when you're dealing with something that's, um, fattish. kind of fattish. Yeah. I would say it's fattish, but it'll, it'll come back. It'll just come back in a different form. In fact, we're seeing that already with the, the plot of graphs and there's, there's a new app for iPhone. It just came out today that you can do it on your phone. Um, yeah, there's a couple on the phone. In fact, I was at Disneyland, Disney World, Disneyland. I don't know. I get it mixed up um, here in California, and I was playing around with one. And it, you know, it was just an online, it, not an online app, but it was just an iOS app that allows you to do those those sorts of things. Um, but anyway, yeah, I digress. Pixel Loop. Pixel Loop. Yes, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, I got a shot of me and Groot up there. For some reason, he only he only said three words every time I talked to him. But anyway, so so he. Um, you know, the the point that you make about you making money with cinemagraphs and then it's sort of drying up is a good segue into the topic for this episode. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the idea of is it viable? Are photography businesses viable these days? And, you know, I want to I'm you know, you you have a good perspective on it. Our, our special guest interview, Jeff Cable, also had some insight into, you know, the whole managing your your life work balance side of the equation. But I wanted to have you on because you are a, you know, one of the, the few people that I know that are a really, really straight shooter, right? So you're going to tell us like it is, you're going to tell us your experiences, not that your experiences are going to mirror everyone else's, but you're going to tell us your experiences, ups and downs about making money with your camera. So let me let me start it off. I'll I'll prime the pump and light the pilot light with this. <laughs> hey, <laughs> all right, dude. <laughs> with this part. So, um, is it possible to? And I'm going to put a fine point on this because you you know just saying, hey, is it possible to make money with your camera? Yeah, of course you could go do that right now. Is it possible to? thrive making money with your camera there's surviving and there's thriving you know surviving is we're eating and maybe ramen noodles and you know whatever canned goods or whatever um thriving is there's more money in the bank at the end of the month than than your bills and you're able to buy some toys and and all that stuff is it which one which one is it g is it is it possible to to survive or thrive maybe (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no no you're in the hot no, seat um, you're you're the straight it, it, shooter it, man come on it, it is it it is but it's dependent on a lot of factors and that's where things become difficult um many 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 factors and so now people will say oh the market's dying and they, they've been saying that you should have seen the looks on people's faces around 2006 when digital really started to take off mm-hmm. people are like i'm gonna go out of business and it's like no dude just just buy a digital camera and continue on you're good you know um but it, things changed over time, and it's uh, it's like riding a bull. You have to hold on, and sometimes you get knocked off, and then you see where it's going, and you try to get back on that thing, and not get stuck with a, you know, not get stuck with a horn. It is, it is possible. It's difficult to sustain a steady income. Is that's where it's difficult because you get paid by each job you do. So if you're relying strictly on photography, you could make a lot of money month and then you can go for months maybe even years and not make anything or very little you know and that's where it gets difficult and then you have to decide you know how much fight you got in you if you want to make your living with with photography 
And uh, that's, you know, that's where it gets difficult. But then, I mean, God, there's so many factors. Like, so let me rewind briefly. When I first started full time, I love corporate America. I'm so tired of working for corporate America to be poor. And I was for two years. I was on food stamps for two years. And I got into food photography, partly so I can eat the food. And um, <laughs> so I made your a ton food of, addiction. <laughs> yeah. And, and I made a ton of calls, uh, emails, and. You know, and I'm like, people, I'm just not going to give up. And eventually people started paying attention and they saw the work was unique and different. And I started to get a lot of work. Uh, and then once the economy died, things stopped. And that's kind of when I was starting to develop the cinema graphs at that time. And uh, then things came back and I jumped on there and that. And I got into blogging early on uh, and social media and whatnot. That helped me. And now things are shifting away from a lot of blogging and social media as far as like in the corporate social networks, I'll, I'll say, um, you know, and I've shifted again. Um, so it, to, to, you know, if you want to have a consistent living with photography, first of all, you need to know who you are as a photographer. And that's the hardest thing for most people, partly because you're getting a lot of their information on YouTube. When you're getting information on YouTube or other other places that were, you know, I don't want to mention names, but, you know, just pull one up. You have to ask yourself, who am I getting my information from? Are they themselves making a living with photography? Are they really doing it? Or is it just a bunch of BS? Look at their, look at their body of work. Are you, are you inspired by that? Is it good work? Cause a lot of it isn't good. So is it good? Oh, it is good. Okay. Who are they working with? How often are they working? How often are they updating their website? That is a, 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 you know, a um, indicator right there. Someone is making fresh work and not how many followers they have on Instagram because some of the world's best photographers like Nadav Kander doesn't have a lot of followers on Instagram. Yeah. Sandra doesn't have a lot of followers on Instagram, but some dork doing God knows what has a gazillion followers on Instagram. So if you are to sum it up, um, I guess to put it simply, if you want a business that happens to sell photography and you're okay shooting whatever you need to shoot to make, make it work in your market, whatever market that is, you can have a sustainable income, but it has to be, you have to detach yourself from the love of the art because that's just a business. If you are an artist first, you're going to have a lot of bumps in the road. Yeah, um, see, I can tell scary. you, that's scary. Dude, that's the scary part right there. That's that's that whole That's the truth though, dude. I'm an artist first. And you know, it's like I've had dude, I've had months where the money was ridiculous and I was like, you know, if you get a few more months like this, there there will be that Ferrari. And then there's like <laughs> other months where I'm just like, dude, and and it's been now it's been it's been a few years and it's been really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the thing. Yeah, I mean you hit on a couple of of uh nerves there. One of them is the consistent sustained income. Right. And I think that's that's one of the one of the myths that that I that we should try and dispel with this, that, hey, if you the money's just going to flow in, you know, when you <laughs> when you become a photographer, for some people, it may, you know, everyone's experience is different. But but setting expectations accordingly, it's a sine wave. Right. I mean, it is a you're you're going like this, you know, hey, wow, look at this. I'm Sometimes. buying I'm buying a Tesla. You know, everybody's yeah. And then down here it's like, uh, they're gonna come repossess my car. I hope I get that check that that client promised me. And then up here again, you're like, Hey, I'm moving to New York City, Manhattan, you know. So, you know, so in your opinion, how do you stabilize that? So obviously it's always gonna be a sine wave, but how do you get it to be flatter for you know, so that you're not you know, grasping for straws and changing your diet, your diet based on your, your income. You any solutions for that? So if, yeah, totally. So if you love photography, if you're coming at this from the right brain to the left, that means you're an artist and you're, you're wanting to make art that matters to you, that, that you feel just, you know, you, you have, you have conviction when you're creating it, maybe you're helping a community, whatever it is, you're, you're you want to have a positive impact, then you need to have other sources of income to sustain you because you're going to get emotionally drained. You're going to get emotionally drained when you're trying to market, when people don't respond to you, um, or people, and I got a story to tell you later on, but when people do crummy things to you, when they know that you're trying to make a living with your art, um, it's emotionally taxing. 
uh, you know, I meditate twice a day. I feel like I eat fairly well. Um, you know, I've been going to a therapist for a, for a few months, dude, straight up. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I can't, I'm not going to lie to anybody. People need to know how, how difficult it can be. But as long, in my view, as long as I am making the light at the end of the tunnel brighter and I'm making work that I feel good about at night and, and I am making work that at this point in my life, I want to have a positive impact on the community. Um, I'm not trying to sell a hamburger. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, and I'm going in that direction. So I feel good about it. Like you sleep well at night, but I have to do other things to make the income grow, not even grow, but just more, be more sustainable. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, have it's a, not, I have a son now and it's like, you know, and a lot of the, the, the majority of the financial burden has been on my wife's shoulders for some time. It kind of flip flopped when Roman was born, I was traveling a lot and then I stopped traveling so I can stay home more and her career started to grow and now she's on her road a lot. So you have to be ready for a lot of th- like role reversals and there's all these things that'll come with you that'll come with it. Um, especially when you are trying to make really good work cause that is a, a spiritual practice. Um, as much as anything I've had, sp- I've had many spiritual experiences this year alone doing the work that I'm doing. And, um, to the point where afterwards I'm just like, wow, I feel like, I mean, you feel it. It's like, you know, you, you want to have an, it's like you're having an emotional experience at the same time. Yeah. That's not the kind of effect you get when you're creating for, a, um, uh, a business. If you're creating for a business, maybe you have other photographers work for you and you're out just shooting weddings and every wedding is more or less the same and they're creative, but you're not necessarily making art. Um, yeah. and I know it's going to piss off a lot of people, but it's true. Like if you, if you know that, Hey, we're doing this year, I'm going to shoot 50 bouquet shots and whatever, it, you know, it's creative, but it's not, it's maybe it's, it's really calling an artist, stretching it, uh, event photography. Um, if you're photographing well, that's other a, artists. That's a, that's a good point on the event photography side. So do, do these things have to be mutually exclusive in that you, you know, you, you could be in service of your art, you know, and telling stories and you have that burning flame in the back of your head that you have to get out and you have to tell. We've all had that where there's this thing that keeps you up at night and you got to you got to get it out, you know, and, and tell the world. And that's your yeah, that's your particular flavor of art. But uh, on the other side, there's reality. <laughs> right. So not that art isn't reality, but the reality of mortgage payments and car payments and food and braces and you know all that stuff that that your art is not necessarily going to sustain so in that world g does it make sense and i'm just hypothesizing here in in that world does it make sense for the photographer to say you know what until i can do what i want to do which is this art that's burning in my head i'm going to do what i have to do which is you know, not to not to crap on event photographers or anyone like that but i'm going to do event photography i'm going to do uh, you know, I want to stay in the the world of photography so I can exercise my shutter finger. So I'm going to do, you know, uh, glamour shots at the mall. I'm going to, you know, whatever it takes. I'm going to I'm going to keep shooting and make money in any genre by any means necessary until I can do the stuff that I want to do. Is that is that viable or should the or should the photographers just suck it up and starve and borrow and do all that stuff and only do the kind of art that they want to be doing? What do you think? It's it's different for everybody, and there's nothing wrong with. A few weeks ago, um, there's nothing wrong with having a gig job where you're doing grocery delivery or Uber. There's nothing wrong with any of that as long as you feel good about it and you're not hurting other people. There's nothing wrong with that stuff. So if that's what works for you, then totally totally do it. Where it can get a little sticky is it is if is when your art starts to cross over into that, and you are not maybe prepared people may say oh i love the project you did with um you know the 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 homeless shelter or whatever and it's really inspired can you come shoot our bar mitzvah and you're like uh yeah but you're not and i can't give you that mm-hmm. it's different you, you know what i mean and, and that turn that just comes into the, the conversation and um because then also a lot of often you get you know, when you have a, a focused vision, like if you go on my website, you're going to see a very focused vision and a unique vision, but you still get calls for work that doesn't fit into that. And that's okay. And then you can decide, Hey, is this person cool to work with? Is, is the money okay? Am I going to feel good about it? Then you say, yeah, let's, let's do something. Um, if they start saying we want 
your art for our university and we only have $400. And by the way, we need to own the copyright. you will be like, I don't think that's really going to work for me. Mm-hmm. I can do other photography for you, but I'm not making original art in that, in that realm. You know, so yeah. it's different for everybody though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what do you, what do you think that the, uh, the old adage, those, those who can't do teach and which has led to the sort of dearth of, of workshops that we have available to us, photography workshops and, and those, those sorts of things. Is, is that filled with people that can't necessarily do so they're teaching or, or they're, they're really good at photography, but they can't, you can't make a living doing just the photography. You have to add, like you said, this other income stream to the flow, which is workshop so that you can continue doing the other thing. Where do you, where do you fall on that? The whole workshop scene? Yeah, you know, when I first time I heard that, I was like, whoever made, whoever came up with that saying was angry, um, <laughs> was angry. I mean, but in, there is some truth to that. So, I mean, if I really enjoy teaching and I enjoy sharing my knowledge, that's why I come on on your show and I'm just, I have no filters. I'm like, you want to know the truth? This is the truth how I see it. Um, whether people will want to hear it or not, because you, you, someone's got to be that guy and I'm happy to be that guy. Yeah, yeah. Um you're you're our token that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's that's cool, man. People know that I'm a straight shooter, hundred percent, right. and yep. and that's the only way I'm gonna be. But I enjoy teaching, and I know a lot of people enjoy teaching and are good at, it. and I don't think of them any less than I would if they were shooting full time, like all the time. And quite frankly, like when I have moments, where like I'm doing nothing but shooting, at, I'm like, dude, I need a freaking break because it's taxing, mm-hmm. and. Um, at that point, I'm happy to go teach and maybe even skip. I've been in the past. I've skipped on some assignments because I'm just like, I'd rather go do this workshop in Seattle or, or whatever and connect with, with people on a different level and inspire them to look at the world in a different way for a change. Because there are, you know, a lot of people hate their jobs. So if I can help them out, cool. You know, and then there are people. And I think, I, you know, I guess I'm, I guess in, in a way I'm a good teacher in that regard because I'm I'm still active in creating my craft. I think where teachers fall into a trap is where they get comfortable doing nothing but teaching. And then you're like, well, what have you created? And you're like, oh, that, I don't really like the way that looks. That looks like you made it 10 years ago with a super high pass filter and, you know, and they're stuck in that that rut. Mm-hmm. I don't not to say that their knowledge is is invalid but maybe they need to take a break and go out and, and and get into that uncomfortable zone and and create something and break some ground and then come back and share that knowledge yeah it's hard it's hard to, you know I, I did an interview today um with actually i did two interviews today um one with rick salmon and who was the other one anyway rick salmon was was talking about um just that idea you know getting getting creative getting out of your rut you know, finding inspiration and that sort of thing. He some really good, some really good tips on how to do that. Um, here, here's a, a, a curveball at you, Julio. So the, um, you know, in the in the beginning, you sort of mentioned the, you know, the the sort of mediocre photographer that has a gazillion views or likes or hits or whatever, and the great or the better photographer, let's say is you know got got a, a iv drip of traffic to their site etc um you know it, what do you where where does skill and honing your skill as a photographer versus honing your skill as a marketer come in right because it's a balance there because if you if you are an um, you spend all your money like if someone gives you 10 marbles and that's your currency and you spend all 10 marbles on becoming a great photographer, you're going to be an excellent photographer, but you run the risk of no one ever seeing your stuff unless, you know, the universe intervenes and, you know, something happens. Um, but and if conversely, if you take all those marbles, you're a mediocre photographer, you take all those marbles, throw them on the marketing side. Now you get a gazillion views and everyone knows your name, but your work is sort of meh, you know, um, we, what's the happy what's the happy medium in there what's what's the solution how many of those 10 marbles how many should i allocate to marketing and which one should be heavier than the other i think in terms of time you should be putting about 60 to 70 percent of your time into your marketing mm. 
Wow. So to be effective. Um, but not your, not your dollars. Uh, in 2007, I was in a bunch of source books. I think I spent like around 25 grand that year just in those. And I got two emails for people that wanted us to assist for me. That's it. Um, versus if I used that time, that money, which is time, right, to make a bunch of phone calls and get out there and meet people in person, probably would have had a higher yield, uh, higher uh, return on my time and money investment than spending that. But that's how you, you, you have to be, if you want to be a successful financially, uh, anything, you have to spend your majority of your time and effort in marketing. Mm -hmm. And people don't like that because it's, it's scary. And some people say it's sleazy and it taints the art and maybe it does a little bit, but you have to get the word out. And I'm not talking about social media that that doesn't work for like 95% of photographers, maybe more ask, ask, ask Zuckerberg. He, well, he won't tell you, but, yeah. um, it won't work for free. I mean, it's, it's, social media is very effective as, if you have a budget right? and it's very effective if you know your market. So if yeah. you're doing, if you are a commercial photographer, if you're working and trying to get jobs, making ads, marketing to consumers on a, on a consumer platform, which is social media is not going to work for you. All that's going to do is, um, get other get consumers interested in you. So if you're not doing headshots or weddings or whatever, may not be the right platform for you to put your time in. You're better off uh, meeting people in person, you know, real social media, uh, making phone calls, mailing postcards. And then even then it may not happen. Uh, it's a long game and it's a hard game and people don't want to hear that. People want to go on YouTube and be like, some dude's like, what's up? Here's five ways <laughs> to up your game. Here's, you know, what are they using? They're using, they use all these terms. Here's, here's five ways to hack your marketing. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, and it's I'm like, writing that down. that's a good one. Use right. <laughs> Damn, what's the other one? Um, they use all these. Well, though, terms. yeah, uh, I'm always, you get torqued. I'm, you know, I, yeah, I'm always, I, whenever I see a headline or a book title or anything with the word secrets in it, I'm always, I always turn it off. I'm like, come on. Secrets. If it was a secret, you wouldn't have put it in a book. Right. <laughs> right. You know, I, I have found um what's I have found that, that people that now more than ever value a true, honest connection. I used to use the word authentic, but that's been murdered thanks to social media marketing. We want something authentic. Okay, go go, go pose over by that person's Lamborghini over there and act like it's yours. Make it authentic. You know, it's just like uh, but yeah. people more than ever have value a real human connection. Uh, they want to, and they, they value making art that, that matters now more than ever. And that is where I think it is important to truly do your smart marketing. I, I use printed portfolios again. I do handwritten note cards. They don't always work, but they're far more effective than sending out a ton of emails to a ton of randos and hope to God that someone looks at the copy that you wrote for a thousand people and says, Hey, that must, that must mean it's for me. Mm -hmm. Um, meeting people in person is, these are important things. Uh, as I mentioned many times on the show, I'm always out when I'm out, I'm, all, I'm always out with one of my ex pro two. So lately it's been both. I always carry an Instax printer in there. I photograph somebody on the spot. I make them a print on the spot. It's magic. I mean, it's freaking magic. I give them that in the business card and now you have a, a real human connection when I send out note cards, um, I send out with the larger square in stacks that look a little like a smaller Polaroid. People love those. I actually get emails when I send note cards out and they say, thank you for the instant prints. They love them. That That is a, a positive impact on someone's life when you send them a, a, a photo that that is important to you, but it's also important to them versus putting all this time and effort into liking or, or going on Instagram or whatever. And then hopefully... Hopefully, if you're rocking it out, you get an emoji symbol because that takes more effort than just, you know, double tapping the screen, hopefully. But then you're fighting the algorithms. And then are you doing the right ad buy or should you do a sponsored post versus, um, so, you know, it, it's you're much better doing it old school right now until there, until social media, mainly Facebook changes their their business model where you can you, you have more of an idea of what you're going to get. And what you're not going to get right now, it's I think it's still too murky. It's, it's muddy, yeah. It's muddy and murky, and you know what? I want to uh, one of our uh, 
the live stream viewers here, good dogs in the chat room. Uh, good dog just said the romance of being a full time photographer is spoiled by the reality of having to be a business person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. It's mm -hmm. true. That's the whole good dog. That's the whole gist of this this session here that we're talking about is we, is understanding that line because you know you could be the person that's trapped and you know I say trapped, but you know I loved it when I was doing my corporate days for the most part. Um, but you could Not be me. in you could be in corporate America. There's, there's some. Um, but you could be in corporate America dreaming about and, and you know, city league like G and I were talking about this before I started streaming. You know, you got that spreadsheet out. You have the you got that spreadsheet out, you're sitting in your computer and you're like, Okay, there's fifty two weeks in the year, so roughly fifty two weekends. Um, and if I multiply that by two weddings a weekend at this rate, I'm crushing it, right? I'm quitting my job. <laughs> tomorrow that's you know okay let me let me make it more complex let's take out benefits let's do all this other stuff you know um but it's not that simple like good dog says the, that's the romance um but the spoiled part is the marketing the emails the pounding the pavement like g was just talking about the phone calls the not returned phone calls the not returned emails and building up the thick skin while also making sure you're still an amazing photographer right so that's that's the balance right g yeah and, and it gets worse too it's like people will up straight up lie to you you know yeah. and strangely enough i get that more since i moved to texas than i have in any other place straight up at least, and, you know, not to diss on people in Texas because I met way more good people than not. But when I'm in New York, if someone doesn't like you, you know it like right away. And, you know, they, at first like, oh, that stings. But, you know, thank you because now, you know, mm -hmm. um, here it's been really hard for me because I'm just so straight with people that they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to introduce you to such and such. And then you're like, you write an email. Oh, I've been busy. And I'm like, well, cool. That email intro takes what? A minute and a half if you type slowly then you're okay well you write them again you know what i mean so you deal with that the other thing is i pass out these gorgeous printed portfolios these are sorry i'll tell explain this too but these are awesome so this is what it looks like when i send it out wow if you go on my website this is one of the images it's a, a shot i did in church yeah we talked um, about that last last time yep, you were on. yeah there's the back but this is exactly how i send it out and then i put I'm going to turn around so you don't see the person's name, but I put a handwritten note card in there from Moo, and then inside there I put some Polaroids and whatnot. Um, this, I mean, is not, this is not open because I don't think they even looked at it, and they held on to it for a few weeks. Wait, now do they send you? Do they send the portfolio back to you, or do they get to keep it? Yeah, no, 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 they do, they do. Um, I sent this to them. I'm opening it now, and. I'm going to hide their name, but this is exactly what it looks like. Hold on. I'm trying to. That's my note card. I put a um, handwritten note. Yeah. This is one of the Instax prints. Okay. It says Hope. I have a, it, you know, it's, it's from the series that's on the cover. On the back, I have a different series of my uh, back exploitation just because I thought it was cool, you know, to have something on the back. And I put a handwritten note. Uh, the focus on my portfolio is gentrification and mental health. When the book is ready for me to pick up, just hit me up. Um, they've held on to it. And I always have three. You always keep one with you. Two, two to always circulate. Some you mail and you put um, a prepaid uh, uh, a thing in their uh, label so they can send them back. So you don't want the, them to pay to have it shipped back. Um, and then other ones you drop off locally and you just put a note card in there. And they usually hit you up. But he held, they held on to it for two weeks uh, right before I went on vacation. I'm like, hey, is it ready? Is it ready? And then right before I left. Like, yeah, we told you it was ready. I'm like, never got that email. So anyways, I go to pick it up. So they had it now for three weeks and they never even opened it up to look at it. And you get that. And when you get that, it's like, you know, it sucks. But at the same time, you, you're pretty clear at that point that you're not going to be working with them. And that's OK. Yeah. And then you just move on to the next person. How do you, uh, how do you how do you reconcile that, though? So that's that's like literally analog old school. Right. That's how that's how they done it for, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of years. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you reconcile that with, hey, I could just do a targeted Facebook campaign towards this zip code and send them to a URL that has a video of me saying, hey, I'm Julio Shorio and here's some of my work. Click here to hire me and enter your credit card number if you want to, you know, leave a deposit to book me on this date or whatever. 
like how how do you how do you reconcile it doing it the old school you know foot foot or feet on the street method versus the tools that we have available today? You know that that's a great question, and it depends on the type of photography you are doing. If you are a retail photographer, that means B to C, direct to consumer portraits, weddings, um, that kind of thing, baby photos. Then you should totally be doing some sort of paid marketing on socials because that's where the consumers are. I'm going after ad agencies, going after direct to uh, um, corporate uh, marketing uh, divisions. I'm looking for philanthropic work within companies. The, these the people, are, those people are on socials, but they're not on socials as that that necessarily as that entity. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is is an exception. So I find in in the differences between what I do and what say uh, often uh, retail photographers do is retail photographers are more like they do may do one or two shoots unless they're really good with that person or that family. Um, I'm looking to build long term relationships, and to do that, I want to meet people face to face. I don't want people to. I, I'm not the type. Of, I, I don't get hired through an, an email and my website. I wish I could. Like I thought about it. I looked at it hard. I'm like I just don't know how I could do that. Uh, and some of these big campaigns, cause I've really, realistically, I can only manage maybe a hundred leads and grow those leads. Yeah. Um, but to do that like a thousand or so, like, no, nah, not, not a, not a relationship that I want to grow long term. I mean, cause the thing is when someone hires a, a commercial photographer or in my, in my, I mean, I consider myself an artist with a camera, but you're, you're putting, these people are putting their jobs on the line and they want to know they're hiring somebody who's reliable, who can deliver something real. Um, that's something that's going to help them sell their product or service and help them look good to their, to their clients. And, and to do that, you have to have more of a, a personal relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that that's, a you know, and I, I said that kind of tongue in cheek, the whole idea of, of using Facebook or, or media like that, because you're right, because what you're going for is a higher end clientele and a higher end local clientele that you can go and sit down with and flip through the pages of your book and tell them the intimate stories behind each shot versus, hey, I'm selling a, an ebook for, you know, thirty seven dollars. And it's all about volume at that point, your your quantity or quality over over quantity. Um, Your scenario, by the way, is amazing. I'm like, flip through and actually talk about the book. That would be freaking awesome. Dude, Usually what on. happens is you show up and they just kind of go flip, flip, flip. And like, all right. And if you even get that meeting, I yeah. haven't, oh, I had a one face-to-face -face meeting this year. We're just That's one? Wow. Just one. And I mean, I used to get my old portfolios back um, with like grease on them. Like someone must have been like eating potato chips or pizza <laughs> or something like, you know, and, and when you get that, it's like, it's, it's, I find it to be disrespectful at the same time. Like, I don't want to work with this person. Yeah. So yeah. it's just because somebody works filter. at an ad agency doesn't mean they're good at what they do. Yeah. You know? And I would say that a lot of those people would rather be doing it on their own than working at an agency. A lot of them, uh, you know, all right, Jay, there's a, there's a very important question that came into the chat from a uh, low bass or low base guy. Um, he wants to know: Is that Totoro photo bombing you in the background? <laughs> no, no, we're we're getting on the cat bus after here, and we're gonna we're gonna go take a spin. <laughs> oh, is that what he is? Oh man, I love it. Yeah, I love that that little stuffed animal. Like that guys. he is over twenty years old. That Totoro is twenty years old. Wow, I bought him a long time back when I got a bootleg Totoro in Japanese on VHS. Yeah, yeah. For those that don't know, that little stuffed animal object behind Julio is a Japanese character called Totoro. Americans will say Totoro, but it's called <laughs> Totoro. Totoro. Yeah, yeah. it's to Totoro. Totoro. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, check it out if you're into Japanese animation. Definitely check out Totoro. He's uh, it's kind of a staple. All right, cool. All right, G. Um, it's time to roll that interview. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about your the new program that you have coming out, the new coaching program. Speaking of teaching and vision and and Zen type stuff, tell me about that. What's what's going on with that? So I developed finding the photographer's vision based on just years of exercises I, I've done for myself to keep my work fresh and to be able to understand who I am uh, as an artist and to make work that has meaning and, and impact. 
been doing it for years. And last year I rolled it out into a class that I, I launch uh, a couple times a year and I do coaching in the class one, one time a week with the students. Uh, the class is basically designed, you basically, you take the class, you will be a better photographer. Uh, you're not in the class to shoot, you're in the class to think, you shoot after the class. So people are like, oh, I gotta do assignments. You do this, the shooting assignments you can do afterwards. Um, but you are basically diving in deep into who you are as an artist and finding that vision based on a variety of exercises coming out of the end of the class with a, with a, a uh, artist statement, um, basically your elevator pitch and knowing, okay, cool. Out of all the work I have, these are my five super awesome branding images. Now I got to go shoot this photo. I got to go shoot this photo. I got, and that's going to make an awesome portfolio. And that's when the real work begins. Um, it's, it's a very powerful class and there's nothing else like it. It will, it will challenge you. I'm not going to tell you that it's an easy class, but the nice thing is once you are in the class, you're in it for life. You don't have to, uh, pay again, no matter how many times I, uh, uh, update the videos and they've updated them already, uh, several times. So and, and it's our small classes too. I like to keep them small so that there's a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but it's powerful. I mean, it's, it's powerful. These are the tools that I use to predict where things are going. And I'm going to tell you straight up where it's going is vision because the future of our economy is creative. And, uh, if you are, doesn't matter how technically proficient you are, if you want to be relevant in any kind of artist, you have to have a unique uh, ability to make it, in our case, photography that only you can make. And when you do that, you have no competition. Then it's just a matter of finding the right people. So if you want to grow it into a business based on the art, th this is great. Um, and if you just want to make a strong portfolio and feel good about the work you do, this is a class for you for sure. All right. Yeah, very good. Well, good luck with that, man. I think uh, I think you'll do well. I think you do well. You clearly have a passion for vision and photography. And, you know, you put those put that peanut butter in that chocolate and you got <laughs> something good. Right? So awesome. All right, folks. Uh, you know the deal. We're at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. If you want to check out Julio's site and this new program he's putting together, what's the URL for that, G? Smallcamerabigpicture.com. Smallcamerabigpicture.com. Go check them out over there. And, you know, it's time to take the lens cap off for this segment of the show. But uh, we're going to continue. Both Julio, Julio, if you're available for another couple of minutes, we'll mm -hmm. jump into the chat room while we're running this interview that I did with Jeff Cable. So if you're watching this um, and not watching it live or listening to the podcast, this is an incentive for you to come and listen and watch us live because we get to hang out and interact with you guys after we finish with this live segment. So with that, I want to also thank our sponsor for this episode. That's our friends over at creativelive.com, creativelive.com. If you're interested in learning online for free, live you can head over to creativelive.com check out their schedule and watch their programs for free as they stream them live then if you decide hey you know what i missed something i want to go watch that again then you can subscribe and purchase the courses i believe they have a subscription program running now so you can have access to their entire library for one low fee go check them out uh at creativelive.com all right folks and with that for this segment, at least, it is time to take that lens cap off. All right, that's it. So the edit cool. will stop right there. Now we're going to roll the Jeff Cable interview, and Julio and I are going to jump in the chat room. Um, G, G, I think you're going to be on YouTube, right? Am I going to be are, on YouTube? Are you going to be on you're, you're in the chat, the YouTube chat? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. you'll get in the YouTube chat. But right now I'm going to run the uh, Jeff Cable interview that I did with him. Jeff Cable, um, the title of this one is Do Not Start a Photography Business. Jeff is a fantastic guy. He's actually, I've known him for over a decade. And, um, you know, he gets, he gets, seems to get younger every time I see him. I don't know what, what voodoo he's doing over there. But anyway, take a listen, take a watch to this interview. And uh, Julio, Julio and I will join you guys in the chat room.
Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. My name is Frederick Van Johnson. I am your host today. Joining me is my buddy, Mr. Jeff Cable. Jeff and I are going to be discussing the business of photography and some of the reasons why some people shouldn't go into it and some okay. of the reasons so why you maybe you should. Okay, so cool. Jeff, welcome sure to the show, man. How you yeah, doing? Thanks, thanks for holding Thank you. Stand I'm doing well. So you we're muted. You're always this videos on the road, running. How, how did cable, I happen to catch chatting you in I your man this. cave so there? Cool. How'd that happen? Uh, you know what? Uh, thankfully, right. I'm not so traveling So now we get to right just now. pop into chat and just, you know, um, futz around for a couple minutes. Uh, traveling in two weeks. Cool. Hey, I was for personal reasons. My daughter's can graduating they, can college. They hear us? Oh, congratulations. Yeah, in the chat room? Or and, no? then, uh, What's that? and then I'll be in New York Can they hear us in the chat room? No, no, no. And then Costa Rica in July, Africa in August. Be like, now the real truth comes out. So, yeah, exactly. Well, that's a good place to start this interview because you and I were talking a little bit before I started recording. And that was about some of the challenges around running a business. That's the whole gist of this interview challenge around running a, what I call a solopreneurship, oh, wait, right? right? It's I'm just you muted. for the most part. You may have assistants or virtual assistants or whatever, but for the nope. most part, you're, you're it. You're the engine. Yeah. Give me, I want to, I want to keep it concise and sort of dive into a couple of ways that maybe you shouldn't, you know, reasons why that people may not have taken into account when they go into business for themselves and maybe some motivations of why it's the greatest thing in the world. So let's start with the negative. What are, what are, what's yeah, the reason why you is, shouldn't? Yeah, the negative is just the, the time it takes. Uh, yeah. When I started this business and I left the corporate world and I thought, okay, well, I'm going um, to I'm gonna go into business and I'm going to work every Saturday, whether it's shooting a bar mitzvah or a wedding and something like that. And then the rest of the time, I'm just going to relax and spend time at home and hang out and, you know, go sit in the backyard and have a Diet Coke. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, <clears throat> and the truth is it doesn't happen. Uh, running a business, as you said, uh, is – it's, it's all consuming, um, and, or it can be. And it means, you know, you do everything. You're answering the phones, you're dealing with scheduling, you're out shooting, you're editing, you're um, doing accounting, uh, and a hundred other things, marketing, mm -hmm. social media. You're everything. Actually, I've, been, I've, been, I've been really lax on social media the last uh, couple of weeks, just not been on that much. And uh, I think, oh, well, I better get on there. You know, it's like everything calls to you. Like I haven't blogged this week. I have to post something. I've got to get back to these clients. Um, and uh, everything takes time. So, it, you know, what you think is, oh, this is going to be really easy and fun. It isn't. Just yeah. straight up. Because you, you like we were saying is it's like when you when you have that dream and in, in, in Twit Pro in the community, I made the reference to Rich Dad, Poor Dad and the whole idea of, you know, when you when you try to make the thing that you love into the thing that's paying the bills, mm -hmm. you run a huge risk of making that thing you know, your albatross or something that you, you just, you just hate. And I think part of it is like what you hit on. I want you to expand on that a little bit. The idea of, okay, I love photography. You are an amazing photographer. You know what you're doing. You love retouching. You love shooting all that stuff. I do. But then you got, you probably love the social media stuff about it too, but there's so much to do. Does that yeah. weigh on you? I mean, does that, you know, I sure. can imagine laying in bed at night like, oh, man, you know, I know I got to shoot tomorrow and I love shooting, but these are the 30 things I have to do around that shoot yeah. that I don't really love that much. How does that work? Yeah, it's, it's really hard. Uh, and, you know, being ADD and having a brain like mine is, is, you know, both a gift and a bad thing. Um, because you're right, I do. I sit there and I think about all the things that aren't done. And I have notes to myself, like, make sure that you post something. Make sure you blog, uh, you know, get a blog out. So yesterday I cranked one out because I hadn't done one in a while. And it does. It weighs on me. And um, I, you know, I do. I sit there and I think about all these things that need to get accomplished. And uh, at the same time, it's tough to balance that with the rest of your life, you know. Mm -hmm. And you've got friends that want to do things. And and of course, one of the challenges being a photographer and shooting events is you're gone a lot on the weekends. And so that also is tough because a lot of times people you get invited to parties on Saturday and we can't go to those. Uh, and so um, another challenge. And uh, you know. It's interesting when you talk about the challenges of doing what you love and also making it a job. I still love what I do. I went out and shot portraits the other day and, and you know, it fills my cup. I love creating and, and you know, giving that, that gift of really great photos to someone. I've been doing this for 15 years and it's still a, not a job. I still love doing it. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't times when I'm shot out at an event. Um, yeah. But I still love it. But at the same time... Um, you know, I, I don't go out and shoot very often just for the fun of it, uh, right. which I used to do. So there's a little bit of that. But it's really more uh, of just uh, 
like like when we started talking about this, it takes a lot of time. It just yeah. does. Yeah, and there's and that's the thing. There's only a finite amount of time in the day for the job and building the business, and then you know, is it what's left over goes to your family and that sort of thing. I did this interview with yeah. uh, with Kobe Bryant's photographer. Um, they co-wrote a book called The Mamba Mentality. And he was talking about, you know, how Kobe Bryant is driven, right? He's driven, driven, driven to be the best. Right. And he was talking about Kobe. He knows Kobe personally. And he was talking about how Kobe's mentality is it's all about the business and the game. And, you know, to the in some ways to the detriment of other things that could that other people think are important, like yeah. family and all that stuff. It's like, yeah. I want to be the best no matter what. And I've made that decision to sacrifice or make everything else secondary to make the game right to make the game primary do you, i mean can photographers do that i mean if you oh, want to say in your yeah. world i want to be the best i want to be the jill mcnally i want to be the whoever of this industry and you know what the bar mitzvah the graduation all that other stuff that could wait you know but the, no, I mean, it, it is um yeah it, it, absolutely and especially with people like uh like myself where i've got that i am driven yeah um and i and um and i feed off of that but yeah, absolutely it can um it does, and of course, also I'm one of those people where, when I get focused on something, I'm in. Like when I learned to play ice hockey at 37, who the heck does that? Um, wow. And I never really ice skated, but I made it a passion. Like I really wanted to learn, and I've been playing for the last, you know, 18 years or whatever, and I love it. But at first, it was like all in. Like all I could think about was I just want to get back on the ice. Um, and the same thing with photography. You know, I want to be always keep improving and getting better. Uh, and I, I hope I do that each time I shoot, but it is, it's like I get focused and, um, yeah, I mean, much like Kobe, but I don't get the paycheck he does, no. but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we tend uh, to focus on things and let other things go. And, and trust me, I have a lot of guilt about, um, the fact that, you know, I've, I've traveled so much and, uh, you know, missed a lot of things with my family and, and that's hard. And, um, the other thing that I find is that trying to find that balance between, you know, answering emails from people who I don't know, who are asking questions about lenses or whatever. Uh, and, and if I do that, then am I, am I not spending time with, with the people that are supposed to be the most important people to me? And so this is something, uh, again, that you have to deal with. And, you know, in the case of, uh, of an email from someone I don't know yet yeah, might wait for a couple of days, but there's, like you said before, you still have those other 30 things that are on your mind. You know, the clients that, that you need to get back to, or, you know, uh, right now B and H I'm doing a presentation there in June, they need course descriptions. Mm -hmm. And so I've got to work with sponsors to, to see what works for them too. And it's like this dance of trying to do all that before I can answer one email. Well, that could take hours. Um, that and I mean, how do you, but how do you balance that? And that's a, that I think that's, this is probably an unanswerable question, but you got all this stuff to do. You're shooting, you're trying to stay on top of your game. So you got to stay on top of like, you know, you got to stay sharp, which you do by yep. shooting. Um, but then there's new gear, there's new techniques, there's new software. I got to update all these things. Adobe updates this, what it, you know, there's all that stuff. Even when you carve out the time and you say, you know what? I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what this, this whatever time management book says, and I'm going to stop working every day at 6 p.m. And after 6 p.m. is family time. Right. You could say that and you could do that and go hang out and watch Game of Thrones with the family or whatever. But back here in your mind, you're like, uh, you're probably writing emails and yeah. organizing. And I've things. done that, you know, and you know, I'll go for a walk with the wife, uh, with the dog and we'll yeah. be walking. And my brain is thinking, oh, God, I need to get back and I've got to do this. and I got to yeah. do that. And, and sometimes I'll drive my wife crazy because I'll sit there and tell her my list of things to do, which is probably the last thing in the world she wants to hear. But, you know, I'll just say like, oh, God, I need this, this and this done. And it is. It's like it's stuck in my brain. And, um, you know, and, you know, if I if I knew that balance, uh, I'd be much better off for it. I, I don't know that balance. And mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to find it. And to your point to say, OK, every Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm not going to work. Um, I'm going to spend it with you, uh, my wife. And, but you know, it just, you, you can't, yeah, no, uh, you can't. Yeah. And it, can't. I wonder if it's like, you know, I was watching this documentary about Elon Musk the other day and, and Elon Musk has five kids, right? <laughs> so and, he really? yeah, he has five kids and he was quoted as saying like, they were working on some release of Tesla or something. And he was quoted as saying to his team, he's like, I don't care what time it is of time of day, three o'clock in the morning, I'm available to you, you know? call me and then in my head i'm like 
does it take that level of commitment and self-sacrifice in order to reach those levels of greatness? And are you happy at that level? Well, right? Because he's missing you know, five five I, kids. You're missing a, a ton of stuff, right? Yeah, I, I, you know, I guess I have two thoughts about that. One is, okay, so uh, yes, he says that to his kids and he, he's saying that to the press and who knows how he's actually living that. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, in a way that's kind of sad though, if you say to your kid, hey, call me at three in the morning, because that means I'm not home. Um, you know, I, I, and this is something that I grapple with, which is um, I haven't had time to talk to my daughter in the last couple of days, and it's frustrating. Um, I talked to my son, but I haven't talked to my daughter. And it's like, I've been busy, and so I haven't had a chance to call her back or whatever. And that's not okay. And, um, you know, now granted, she's in Oregon right now, and I'm in California. It's not like I can just walk over next door. But, yeah. but the point is like, it's kind of sad if you have five kids. I don't know how old his kids are, but to say, gee, give me a call. Yeah. That means you're not available. And no, so, no, no. See, he was saying, he was telling his staff, the people that are working on Tesla, oh, that he was available to them 24 hours a day. Yeah. yeah. I think it's the kids. No, no, to the, no. To the, to the company, yeah. well, you know, at the go. detriment I mean, of spending yeah. time with the family, I would assume. Right. I, yeah. And, I, and again, this is the thing is that, you know, for someone like him who's running multiple companies and large companies, with, you know, a lot of investors and all that stuff. I can't even imagine um, what the pressure would be like. I mean, mm -hmm. for me, it's running a small photo business, right? Um, but for him, I, I, it's not something I envy. And when I go to Africa on these photo tours and you see the simplicity of the way people live, uh, you know, they've got it. You know, if they if they saw a house like this in Africa, they'd be like, how many families live there? Yeah. Right. Right. And and, and I've been to your it, house and I asked you that, right? Yeah. <laughs> You know, and you look at that, but you know they've got a small home, they've got maybe solar power, or you know they might have power, but they've got a TV and a radio and a couple of lights, and it, you know they may have a car, but they're very happy. They don't have five cars, they don't have three Teslas, uh, but there's a simplicity to it, and, and I think a a level set that we don't have here, um, at least in the Bay Area, and I'm kind of jealous of it, and. Uh, I've tried to I try to remember that as I go through life. And, and one of the things I've thought about recently is how much is enough? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you want to, you know, be the best photographer in social media, you want to be the next Joe McNally. That's a lot of effort. And yeah. Joe's been forced because of it, probably. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so, you know, what is enough? You know, money wise, what is enough? I that's mean, a good question. I mean, that's a, that's the that is the question, because. You know, on the one hand, looking at it from both sides, right? On the one hand, you are, even from it, you know, I would argue against you saying that you're different from Elon Musk. I would, I would argue you're both made from the same stuff, right? You just have different motivations. Elon wants to go to Mars, right? And make us a right, multi-planetary right. civilization. You know, you want to put your kids through college and make, make them have right. at least as good a life as you did or right. better, right? Yep. There's, there, those are equal, you know, in my head. You, it's what's your motivations, and then I look at it from the standpoint: if you, if you were to stop doing what you do, you're doing, your quality of life would drop, and so yeah, would I mean, the I quality of life of your family, right? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, again, this to point to like how much do you need to to retire and, mm -hmm. and just you know be okay, and you know maybe we're there, um, but I don't know. And, and but I, I don't it, it, people think this sounds weird, but I don't shoot necessarily because of the money I shoot because I love doing it. Mm. I mean, granted, it's nice not to dip dip into savings every month, um, but it's a combination of both. Um, but you, I guess the, the point is when you talk about running the business and prioritizing family and business, I think someone like myself, like you said, kind of like Elon Musk, where we're so driven to be successful and, and be the best and answer every email from everybody who follows us and all that, which I do. Um, and that does fill my cup at the same time. I got, you know, I, like many people, you know, I've been guilty of, of doing that, um, in preference of spending time with the family and, you know, trying to make everybody happy as opposed to the people that are most important to us. So yeah. that's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing's a challenge. I mean, it's a, it's like a plate spinning balancing act, right? Cause if you put, you put too much, you know, spin on this plate, then those suffer and vice versa. And right. like you end, can't just turn your business off. Like if your family says, Hey, we want you for three weeks, yeah. you can't just say, okay, I'm not going to answer emails for three weeks. Cause then, you know, your corporate clients can be like, Hey, where the hell are you? Yeah. 
we yeah. need to talk to you. Your, you know, your your thing that you're shooting in two weeks is coming up, and they need to confirm with you things. Mm-hmm. So it, you know, um, it's it's hard, and that's what I tell people all the time. Like when you think about running a photo business, and you have to, like I've got stuff uh, in the hallway here that has to be shipped out today. So some print orders and things. So I need to go to the post office. So I'm the delivery guy, right? I'm the postal clerk. I'll post to social media today. I'll start working on the next blog. I have stuff to edit. I have emails to answer for clients. I have to start prepping for, uh, I have to do some orders for uh, another client that, uh, for a sign-in board for yeah. an event. Mm-hmm. All these, like literally, like when you talk to those 30 things, those are on my mind all the time. And yeah, um, yeah it, it's uh, it's daunting. And the people that think, oh, it's really easy because you just hit a button on a camera and you mm-hmm. take pictures. <laughs> it isn't. And to your point, you want to, Try you know new lighting techniques and um, you know trying maybe some different settings on the camera to get you know better take rate on you know really tack sharp images. It's all of those things. You know reading um, books and magazines and all that. I mean yeah. it's hard to you know I'm trying to learn believe it or not Swahili right now because I spent so much time in Africa. Nice. So I spent the last forty days on Duolingo working on learning Swahili. So I take. I carve out 20 minutes every day to work on that. And it's like, but you know, that's 20 minutes, which is not always there. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Time is the finite, the finite resource. So, yeah. so here's, here's a question and we can, we can start wrapping it up on this one because we'll, yeah. we'll never tackle this whole topic. Right. Um, but the, the idea of how, like you, you mentioned this, how much is enough? Right. Okay. So, it, 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 you know, putting, putting a box around it and going back to the whole Elon Musk reference, Elon's goal you know, he's drawing a line in the sand. We're going to Mars. I want us to be a multiplanetary you know, civilization in case something happens to this planet. You know, the human race lives on that. That's his uber ultimate goal of what SpaceX and Solar City and all these different entities are driving towards that. Right. What's your ultimate goal, Jeff? What, 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 are, you, what are you shooting for? You know, what, what's the what's the end game for you that you can say, yeah. Crap! I did it. I'm done. You, you know, know, I think on a, well, you know, and it changes, right? I mean, when I first started this and and doing the blog, it was like get as much blog traffic and you know get you know hundred thousand you know readers a month and mm-hmm. you know those types of things. And now that's less important to me uh, than it was. And really, ultimately, uh, right now, my goal is just to be happy and uh, you know and try to make other people happy. And and you know, I think that's the most important thing. Now, whether that's being fulfilled by photography, my family. Uh, myself, all these things, those, that's what I'm working toward. But ultimately, you know, I just want to, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to find a better balance if I could in my life. Cause you know, I, I want to keep everybody happy and, you know, my family included, but, um, for me it, it is, it's just to be happy and to enjoy what I'm doing and to, um, to experience life. I've said this a lot in the past where to me, it's not about the money. It's about life's experiences. So going to Africa on safari as many times as I have and see that is amazing. Um, you know, we're going to India in January. I've never been there. I'm looking forward to that. So nice. to me, and that is what makes me happy. Right. It's just to travel the world, to see what our other cultures are like and things. And that kind of fills my cup. And so ultimately it is to be happy. And, and I do love making other people happy. You know, I'm one of those people that, that, uh, does, get fulfilled by that. So I mean, ultimately that's what I'm going for. Yeah. I love that. I love that. It's cool. That's words to live by. If you could, if you could leave the, the, the TWIP audience with one piece of advice, you know, based on what you've learned over the past 20, 30 years or so, you know, I know it's kind of hard to distill that down. No, I, I, could, I, could, I, I know what it is. Uh, honestly, it's balance. It really is. I mean, and, and I've, I've lived all sides of this. I've been in the corporate world where we were, you know, I worked crazy hours. Uh, and, uh, and I've also, uh, was lucky enough to sell a company, um, in the dot com days, uh, and take some time off, uh, for a couple of years and not work and just kind of hang out and learn how to play ice hockey and stuff. And that wasn't very fulfilling either. Um, yeah. I was you know, aching to get, kind of get back into a new challenge. So honestly, you know, and I haven't found it yet, but if I could find the right balance between, you know, working hard and accomplishing what I want, but also uh, making time for other people and relaxing and all that would be great. So uh, it is the big challenge. I don't have the answer to it, but th- my biggest advice is if you can do it, is to find that balance. Let's find that balance. Okay. Yeah. So, so I know that was, I said that was going to be the last one, but here's the last, last one. <laughs> so so <laughs> you, you can't do that. Yeah. You're, you're, you're the, the, the perfect person to ask this to because, you know, like we started this interview, a, a lot of people are sort of in their corporate jobs and they're dreaming to be a photographer and have their own solopreneurship and live that life 
life, and that's the holy grail in the dream. Right. You you had uh, you were working in in at a corporate job, yeah. you know, at a really big gigantic company. You had a high level senior executive level job, and you left yeah. that to do this. So, yeah. were you happier then, or are you happier now? So no, did- no, I'm definitely happier now. I mean, I I love. Uh, I mean, look, there's a lot of advantages to running your own company. I mean, you you do things on your own time. So I get up in the morning. I usually don't start working till about 10:30. I usually get up. I walk the dog. I try to get at least two or three miles of a walk in every morning. Um, I do take time for lunch. Uh, you know, and yes, I do work in the evenings and do things. But I try to work. You know, work my own schedule. When I travel, I stay at the hotels I want to stay at. I fly the airlines I want to fly. It's not like some corporations telling me what to do. Yeah. Honestly, the only thing I miss about the corporate world is health benefits because they're so damned expensive and not very good. <laughs> yeah. Um, but other than that, I mean, uh, I, I do love. Uh, you know, having my own business, you know, whatever decisions I make affect my myself. Uh, I don't have to fight with some other executive team about decisions. Um, and, you know, it's nice to, to stay home and, and do what I love. I mean, again, uh, I say this all the time when I'm shooting to my clients, I go, this is the best job in the world. Yeah. And when I'm shooting the Olympics and when I'm in Africa and places, uh, I think, God, this is so lucky to do what I do. So, um, you know, it's, it's nice to have that. And I don't look back at the corporate world and miss it. Like I said, other than the health benefits, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. We got to get that fixed. Cool, yeah. man. Well, thank, thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate it. And look at this. I took some of your time when you could be doing other things to do this See, interview. this is the thing. This is the balance. I could be doing other stuff instead of talking to you. I but know. I'm priority. part of the problem. I no, probably... you're a good guy, and, and I love doing this. And, and uh, you, you know, again, trying to find that balance. Yeah, I love it. Part I love of it. it. Jeff Cable, where where should people go if they want to look at the stuff that you're working on or hire you or get on one of your workshop tours or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, actually, I'm not looking for more business because then it takes up more of my time. <laughs> <laughs> no more business. You're going to hang out. That's what you need, a, you know, not open for service sign for your door exactly. back Exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, website's just uh, jeffcable.com, so J-E-F-F-C-A-B-L-E.com. And uh, the blog is just blog.jeffcable.com. Social media is just Jeff Cable Photography, and those are the places to find me. Um, and, uh, I mean, the blog is really where I do stuff every week. I show what I'm shooting, how I'm shooting it and that kind of thing and how I share, you know, generally it's once a week and during the Olympics, it's every day. Yeah. So love it. And, and folks, if you're watching this and you, you have any question about business or photography, feel free to just email her. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer it. I still will do it. <laughs> Poor guy. A couple of days, but I will. Yeah. Cause we all, now we know that you're ADD. You cannot not answer it. Right. <laughs> it's true. No, seriously. And you know, and the other thing is it's very fulfilling. Honestly, when people write to you and say how much they appreciate what we do and how much advice we give, I'm sure you get this too. Yeah. I mean, it's very gratifying that, uh, that anybody in the world would actually listen to you and I right, for advice. So, yeah. uh, I don't take it lightly and, um, you know, and, and it's, it makes us feel good that, you know, people actually listen to what we have to say. Yeah. Love it. All right, Jeff Cable. Thanks a lot, man. We'll see you next time. Sounds good. All right. Peace. This is Twitter.